program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 102. All cars watch closely the operator of nailed cloning. Police depending narcotics. That's all. Rose and close. goes out over the air to hundreds of radio patrol cars, it's often a matter of life and death. For these cars have a second to wait. When that throttle is thrust to the floor, the police car must leap instantly to top speed and fare to the sea. Siren speed. One second may mean a life saved. That's why the most efficient police departments of the West refuse to use ordinary gasoline in police cars and emergency engines. Tests have proved that gasoline made by ordinary refining processes can't start fast enough, can't develop enough speed and power. There's a reason why more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment use Rio Grande cracked gasoline than any other brand. And that reason is the exclusive patented refining process known as cracking. Rio Grande puts gasoline through the newly developed Sinclair cracking process to separate the slow burning from the fast firing elements. What a difference it makes. In scores of tests before police officials, Rio Grande cracked gasoline has proved to be so much faster in starting, so much speedier, so much more powerful that it has been awarded the contract to power all emergency cars operated by Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Marysville, San Diego County, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many other cities and counties. On tonight's program, you will hear a graphic demonstration of the efficiency of our police. Rio Grande Crack Gasoline has contributed greatly to this efficiency. For more police and emergency cars use Rio Grande Crack Gasoline exclusively wherever it is sold than any other brand. And they use exactly the same gasoline you get when you patronize your Rio Grande independent dealer. Try a tank for tomorrow. It is our pleasure to present Chief James D. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Good evening, friends. You have often heard me refer to Los Angeles as the white spot of America's crime map. The phrase is mine, but the statistics which inspired it may be obtained by anyone interested in the work of this police department. During the era of lawlessness, now happily coming to a close, we enjoyed a minimum of large-scale crime as compared to other cities in this nation. This is not meant to imply, however, that we did not have our racketeers and so-called big shots. Many were the hoodlums who tried to muscle themselves into power, but as quickly as they began operations, we began breaking them down. It wasn't always easy. One of the most difficult men we had to break was a one-time petty pickpocket who muscled into the dope racket and made himself a big shot. His name makes no difference. He has paid his debt to society, so for the purpose of our story, we will call him Nail Cronin. <laughs> It was in 1927. One day, Chief Davis summoned Detective Lieutenant Speaker into his office. Good morning, Chief. Come in, Speaker. Sit down. Speaker, you've had a lot of narcotic experience, haven't you? Yes, sir. I was up north to the State Enforcement Bureau for several years. Mm -hmm. You know who nails Cronin is, Speaker? Sure, everybody knows who he is. Big shot dope peddler. Fence. Got 
ambitions to be a West Coast Capone. That's right. They're saying around town that I can't get it. Well, he's a pretty slick customer. None of the boys have ever been able to hang anything on him yet. He lets the mules that work for him take the rap. Yes, I know. He's the hardest sort of individual with whom to deal. But I don't think they're right when they say we can't get it. Do you? No, sir. I knew you'd agree with me. Very well, Sigurd. I'm going to make you captain of the combined robbery and narcotics squad. And I'm going to give you one big job. Get Cronin. Yes, sir. It may take me a year, but I'll get him. Slowly, the police spin their web. A dozen detectives shadow a dozen dope peddlers. Make arrest after arrest. But never can they put the finger on Nails Cronin. Then one day, as Detective Lieutenant Edwards, one of Sager's men, is entering police headquarters, a man approaches him. Hi, Edwards. Yes, what is it? Cronin wants to talk to you. What about? I said I know. He's talking with a family and he wants to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to him. Ah, uh, be a smart guy, Edwards. It'll only take a minute. He's sitting right over there on his car. Well, okay. Hello, Edwin. Hello, Mills. I've been you since the day you tried to pinch me for possession of liquor. <laughs> and you get your face when you found that bottle in the back of my car was full of cleaning fluid. <laughs> yeah, that was very funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same Jim Davis has put his bloodhounds in my trail again. Yeah? Don't tell me you don't know anything about it. You work for Seager, don't you? Yeah. You don't make much money, do you, Edwin? I don't need to tell you what a copper salary is. Would you like an extra two hundred dollars a month for what? Telling me what Sigurd's plans are. No thanks. It's being a little foolish, Edward. I ought to arrest you for bribery, Cronin. Well, but you won't, guy. You haven't any witnesses. Two here, just dumb and blind, ain't you, Sigurd? Huh? Well, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me no thinking of it. Well, how about it, Edward? I told you no. And you'd better move that car of yours. You're parked in the yellow. I can run you in for that, you know. Ah, oh, no, you can't. The loading zone. I just stopped to pick up my friend Sue here. So long, Captain. So he offered you a bribe, huh? That's just fine. What do you mean? He's worried. You must be getting pretty close to him. Sure, we're getting close to him, Captain. I'll tell you that bit of Mrs. Hard I've been feeling, or he'll keep you. I'm sure of it. Well, it's worth a try. Have you booked that Mexican peddler you just brought in, Chipwood? No, he's still outside. Okay, bring him in. Right. Come in, Pedro. Pedro, we've got plenty on you to send you to the big house for a nice long stay. Oh, please, Senor El Capitan, not to have to Pedro. Pedro, one good citizen and taxpayer. Pedro, not a bad man. Here's the two ounces of narcotics we found on you. You can't deny that. Oh, no, but you see, this is the very first time I do anything like this. You let me go, huh? I never do it again. I think maybe we can arrange something like that. Oh, gracias, senor. Capitan, gracias. On one condition. See, senor? That you do a little favor for us. Oh, see, si, senor. Of course, anything I can do. You uh, know a man and his wife of the name of Howard? Mr. and Mrs. Sandy Howard? Sandy Howard? Yes. I know him. I want you to buy three ounces of morphine from them. You want me to? I do not understand. Oh, it is a trap, huh? So you can arrest me all over again. I don't understand that. I'm arrested already. No, I don't want to arrest you all over again, Pedro. I'm after bigger fish than you. I want to arrest Sandy Howard and his wife. Oh, I see. And for buying three ounces from them. You will let me go, please? I think we can arrange it, if you promise not to peddle any more junk. Oh, see, see, I promise. Only words over Gonzalez. Well, we'll give you a chance. Now, here's what you do. You call Sandy Howard and make a date with him to make the buy. You'll have two officers hidden in the rumble seat of your car. After you've given Howard and his wife the marked money... Where do I get the marked money? Don't worry, we'll provide that. And after they've given you the morphine, you clap your hands together and say... Now I can make myself a little Dunell. I clap my hands together like this and say, Now I can make myself a little Dunell. That's right. And that'll be the signal for the two men in the rumble seat to make the arrest. Oh, it's very simple. I'm glad for it to be simple, my good friend. <laughs> Pedro mix 
the bait to meet the Howards at Bowdry and First Street. Around the corner, Captain Seager spots six police cars of plain frozen at the wheel. Pedro, with two officers hidden in the rumble seat of his car, drives up to the corner. A moment later, Mr. and Mrs. Howard arrive in their car. Howard saunters over to Pedro and to Seager, watching from the opposite corner, there appears to be an argument. When did you go around, Captain? Pedro's getting out of his car. Yeah, do you suppose that Mexican's double crossing us? I don't know, but he's getting in the hard car. I'm swinging around. Oh, be gone. What? Oh, and the whole thing. Of Mrs. Hart giving us a bird. She's thumbing her nose at us. Follow them. Don't let them get out of sight. Okay, Captain. Now, wait a minute. There's no use following them. Why not? They're wise. If we tail them, they'll just give us a runaround. Might as well go back to the corner and hope the paper is on the level and bring them back here somehow. That's the funniest thing I ever hear. I did not know the bulls was on my tail, say no how. Yeah. Well, you won't get very far in this game if you don't wise up to things like that. Sure, we never take a chance. They wouldn't have got a thing on us if they had stopped us. Why? Right. What do you mean? They didn't bring you more things? Not with us. You think we're nuts? Why do you take me then? Not well, far. Down this next block here. All right. Watch out the door, Pedro. Here. Yeah, but where is the more thing? It's stashed in that head. Hand us over the door and go pick it up for yourself. Well, okay. But it's a very fine business. It's a very safe business if you do it this way. Right there in front of you. Oh, yeah. Right okay, Pedro. We got the money, you got the junk. Call us up when you need some more. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Senor Howard. What's the matter? You're not going to leave me away here on Sunset Boulevard, are you? Sure. Why not? But my car is all the way over on Bordry. I cannot walk so far. It's too hot. Oh, we might as well take him back, Sandy. Okay. Hop in, Pedro. <laughs> your own car. How's that for service? Oh, bueno, bueno. Gracias, senora, senora. I'm very much pleased to have this stuff. Very much. Now I can make myself a little dinero. <laughs> yeah, Pedro. Hey, you Sam, look. A... There's huh? a couple of cops in that rumble seat. Get going. Hold on, we can't move. Our feet and hands are asleep. Okay, Tom. Want to be able to get his tires now, Captain? I'll try. Almost. You hit the gas tank. There goes again. That did it. Now we're going to find that flat. Force him over to the curb. Did you get him, Captain? Yeah, Captain. Yeah, Captain. Okay, pull over. What's the first, officer? Plenty. You're under arrest for violation of the state poison act. Yeah, you'll have a hard time proving that. Not with that marked money Pedro gave you. Oh, had the stoop to use in a stool pigeon, huh, Copper? Listen, I'll use anything to get Mayo Cronin, and the sooner you realize that, the easier your life will be for the next few years. <laughs> Captain Mr. and Mrs. Sandy Howard, while Captain Figure, striving to smoke out Neil Cronin, has the district attorney set their bail at $100,000 each. Buzzing are the efforts of Cronin's attorneys to lower the bail. Loud are the wailings of Mr. and Mrs. Howard. But the silent rejoinder to pandemonium, they remain in jail. Finally, after a month in the back field, the Howards are separately interviewed. Of the two, Mrs. Howard seems the most pliable. Well, Mrs. Howard, how about it? Ready to give us the lowdown on Mayor Cronin? Listen, Flatfoot, I ain't talking. I told you that 30 days ago. It still goes. You still deny you're one of Mayor Cronin's mules, huh? I never heard of Mayor Cronin, and the only mules I know anything about would be bed slippers to you. 
It would be sort of nice to slip into those mules of yours and wrap yourself in your filmiest negligee after a month in jail, wouldn't it, Mrs. Howard? What are you driving at? Just this. We know all about you and your husband. We know you're running dope for Neil Cronin. We know that Cronin's attorneys have been trying to reduce your bail. That, my dear Mrs. Howard, is the reason we place it so high. Now, after a month in jail, you ought to realize that even if he is a big jock, Cronin can't raise 200 grand to spring you and your husband. Either he can't or he doesn't think you're worth it. Oh, is that so? Well, how have you know that I'm just important? Now, Mrs. Howard, don't let me forget that I think you're a lady. What do you want? Certainly not you and your husband. We want nails, Cronin, and you're going to help us get them. You're barking up the wrong tree. All right, I know that story, and I'm tired of it. I said you're going to help us get him. Okay. For a price. Which is? Sandy's freedom. All right, Mrs. Howard. You'll go further than that. We'll do our best to get the district attorney to drop charges against not only your husband, but yourself. If you'll play ball with us until we get Cronin. It's a deal. With one more stipulation. What's that? But neither you nor your husband go back to the narcotic wagon. Okay. That's a deal, too. And if you do, he'll fix you up with a nice long-term lease on a Marine View apartment at San Quentin. <laughs> so Captain Seeger and the district attorney arranged to reduce the bail on Mrs. Howard for the Cronin's attorney to meet the figure. Immediately upon her release, Mrs. Howard is taken to the detective's office. Well, Captain, here I am. Practically a free woman again. That's fine, Mrs. Howard. Now what do I have to do to spring Sandy? Well, let's see. We've got to make this sound legitimate. I'll tell you. You call Cronin and tell him you want to buy 100 ounces of morphine so you can raise the dough for Sandy's release. Okay. Hand me the phone. You know, Cap, I never thought much of cops before I met you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Why, now I almost got myself believing you're human beings. I... Hello, Nails. Yeah, this is Bertie. I... Yeah, I just got out. And say, Nails, thanks a million for stringing me. Gosh, I don't know what to say. I... Yeah, that told you ain't no boudoir. But say, how about Sandy? Oh, I know you ain't got a hundred grand, but I ain't got a husband neither. I... Listen, here's the dope. I can unload a lot of stuff. My customers' tongues are hanging out. Yeah. Say about a hundred ounces. What? Four grand? What? Well, ain't that a little steep? I... Okay, I gotta get that guy of mine out of jail no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Neil. In an hour. Well? He fell for it. I'm to go to the top of Angel's Flight in an hour from now, get a cab there, and go to the corner of Forth and Alvarado. There'll be a car there waiting for me. It'll take me to him, only I... Only what? Oh, he wants me to bring the cash with me. Four thousand bucks. Four thousand dollars? You haven't got that much money available for purchases. Well, that's the deal. Cash on the line. Well, all right. I got a friend who can raise it. I'll sign my personal note for it. Your personal note? Sure. You don't know how anxious I am to get that bird. <laughs> Grave misgiving, Captain Sugar follows Mrs. Howard and his four thousand dollars in marked money from Angel's Flight to the corner of Fourth and Alvarado. Where Mrs. Howard transfers from the cab to a yellow coupe driven by a Negro chauffeur, which takes her to the corner of Highland Avenue and Sunset Boulevard, where she again changes cars to enter the armored limousine of Mayor Cronin, which immediately starts up Highland for Mulholland Drive. Here, for fear of being detected by the wily Cronin, he got his forced to abandon the case and return to his office. There, for the next several hours, he nearly bitingly awaits a telephone call from Mrs. Howard. Finally, it comes. Who goes, Susan? This is Bertie Howard, Cap. Where are you? Down on the beach at the Tango Canyon. What happened? He had the stuff stashed down here in the canyon. I turned over the dope room and picked up the merchandise. Are you alone? Yeah, he left me. You've gone to his house on South. Yeah, South. I know where it is. Well, he's either there at his service station on Beverly. Okay, Bertie. We'll get on him right away. Want a car to pick you up? No, thanks. I've still got bus there. While Trigger leads one detachment of men to Cronin's house, another detail of detectives speeds to Cronin's gasoline station to watch out for him. At the house, Trigger runs into an unforeseen difficulty. 
Hey, Joe, you and a couple of the boys see it around at the back of the house. Those dogs are better than a siren. Don't let anyone make a getaway. Uh, we can't go and keep it safe. Those hounds will tell us to people. A couple of slugs will get them. Hey, wait a minute. Somebody's opening in the door. Quiet down these dogs and let us in. You heard me quiet down these dogs. Now listen, Curly, I like dogs, but I hate to have to shoot such nice animals as these. But if you don't quiet them down, they'll let them have it. Officers of the law. Oh, yeah, the dog's different. Quiet, quiet, you. 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 Quiet, you.
You know you can't get anything on me. We've got plenty on you now, Conan. Yeah, what's the charge? Violation of state poison act. <laughs> Why don't you get a new job? We mean business, Conan. We're taking you in. Yeah, keep your bracelets in your pocket. I'll go along. I'll be out a half hour after I get to Central. Have a few, too. Call them out for you. Send them to the Central. Yeah, okay. A lot of good that'll do, Conan. That's what you think. <laughs> Captain Sugar escorts the other than Conan into the squad room at Central and presents him with the facts. Now, Conan, listen carefully. I can end the mouthpiece. Don't say a word. You don't have to. And we ain't letting you talk to your mouth, sir. Sorry, boys. Hey, this is unconstitutional. Well, I'll find when to talk about constitutionality. You can't make me talk. Now, listen, Conan. Will you be quiet for a minute? So far, you've done all the talking. Now, listen. Yes, sir. No one's asking you to talk. We're just asking you to listen. Yeah, I see. But I've got a bedtime story, eh? Time don't pay. The policeman's your friend and all that bunker. Eh? You'd be a lot better off if you'd listened to him before. I'll pipe down and get this. You're through. We got enough on you to send you up for a neat little set. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I haven't got any tricks up my sleeve. Now, here's the lowdown. You sold a hundred ounces of morphine to Mrs. Howard today. She paid you with my money. Money I marked myself. We just raided your house and recovered that money. And you know what we found when we found the money. Fifty-five gallon cans with alcohol and ten thousand dollars worth of narcotics. Well, how about it, Nails? Does your mouth see will do you any good now? That you can talk a jury out of that evidence? Captain. Yeah? Can you know, I talk to you privately? Sure. Come on into my office. You'll uh, pardon us, won't you, boys? Sit <laughs> down, man. Cigar? Yeah. Thanks. What? Thanks, Captain. Now, what's on your mind? Let's go, Captain. You really got the good one. Enough to give you a maximum sentence. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Sort of. Let's go, Captain. Here's a key. Two to my safe deposit box. Fifty thousand dollars in that box. And crap. Let's do take the key. Cut this up at twenty grand. I can't let you go now. I know it. But all I ask is this. You take twenty grand and forget some of the evidence you've got against me. You know I've got to take some kind of a lap. You can make it easy on me, Captain. How do you know I won't take the whole 50 grand? Because you're an honest man, Captain Trigger. Boys, Conan just offered me a $20,000 bribe to go easy on him. Here's the key to his safe deposit box. I guess that's what you're used, Conan. Come on. Wait a minute, Captain. You're all right, Conan. I'm an honest man, and I'm not taking any bribes. That, my dear Conan, is part of the job of being an honest man. Captain, Captain Trigger. Just let me out, Captain. Just let me get the guy. Come on, Captain. I'll take him to the south, Sergeant. Well, you can't do it. I'll take him to the south. Give me the boat. Well, boys, there goes the man they said Jim Davis couldn't get. There goes the big shot of the Los Angeles racket. There goes a big cry, lady. Yeah. He reminds me of that guy in a gangster that took the set. He could fish it out, but he couldn't take it.
Two detective mysteries which are broadcast over this program also appear in story form in the Calling All Cars News. You get this unique publication free of charge every month wherever Rio Grande cracks gasoline is sold. And in this month's issue of the news, you will find illustrations and descriptions of nine free gifts which make up the complete junior detective outfit for boys and girls. You can help your young friends get these senior police outfits, if you will, by just driving to a real Grande Crack gasoline pump next time you fill up. It costs you no more than ordinary gasoline. But when this super refined Petra Ethel Peter Jewel reaches your car director, you'll get the thrill of faster starting, lightning acceleration, greater power, and police car performance. <laughs> Starting all cars, attention all cars. Translation broadcast 102. Mail Tony 9 subsidy. That's all. Rose and